That's, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Zumi. I think there, uh, and we, we have a few extra copies of this document, which you can also obtain online. So if you're interested, please see me. We'll direct you to the uh, to the source, Securing Our Common Future, an Agenda for Disarmament. And I actually failed to, to mention that uh, in my uh, introductory remarks. But we, we do have a, a good 45 minutes available for, uh, for Q&A. Uh, I've been compiling my own list, but I'd like to first give the opportunity for those who are seated around uh, the room. If you have questions, please raise your hand and I'll try to identify you. Uh, okay, Melissa, I saw your go first, so go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I was really interested in your remarks. You want to introduce yourself, oh, just I don't know if everybody my, knows you. My name is Melissa Hannum, and I'm a researcher here at CNS, uh, working on East Asia, and, and um, I was really interested in your remarks on uh, lethal force and the idea that artificial intelligence and autonomous weapons are now being considered as a very grave threat in terms of their possible lethality. I wondered if you had any thoughts on how these new technologies affect the role of nuclear weapons in the sort of status quo of the world, and if you think nuclear weapons are um, are still the end-all, be-all weapon that needs to be disarmed. Should I take one? one sure. One? Oh, yeah, why don't we? I mean, well, uh, if, unless anybody. Well, let me, let me suggest, person, if you want to respond to Melissa, uh, and then we'll see. You know, usually what happens, people are intimidated initially, and then by the end of the session, I can't accommodate everybody. So let's start with, on a one-on-one, -on -one, and then if we have a lot of hands go up, we may take a couple uh, together. So I'm collecting the names of others, but why don't you initially address uh, okay. Melissa yeah. if you'd like to. So, I mean, I, I, one thing I really should emphasize is that when it comes to those new technologies, um, we continue to say that those new technologies are uh, mostly beneficial to, you know, betterment of uh, human society. So we're not actually saying that, um, you know, we should ban technology or development of certain technologies. I mean, actually also the AI is not just one, one technology, it's, it's a you know, combination, it's a whole range of different kinds of technologies. Um, so that's an important sort of a, um, caveat that I, I need to make. We have no intention of saying that these technologies are bad. Uh, but because of the, the dual um, usage, you know, nature of, of those, um, we need to be aware of the, what I usually call it the dark side, if those are utilized for weapons, um, you know, if they're weaponized, then they will be probably a, a very serious consequences to international peace and security overall. Um, meaning that there is a potential to, not just potential um, in terms of, um, you know, um, changing um, the battlefield, you know, I mean, there is, there will be probably a risk of, you know, risk in terms of escalation controls, the threshold um, use, I mean, there's a concept of, um, you know, casualty-free uh, warfare. So there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, implications that we, in the past, did not have to think about, but so we, we now really have to start thinking about those um, really new sets of uh, challenges. Um, I personally think that uh, a real sort of, um, you know, scary picture is a combination of those technologies with nuclear weapons and then you know the sort of weapons of mass destruction in, in general um, so um so we need to actually now start thinking about what are the risks associated with those new technologies and then in fact the gge is looking at some of those um, let me just talk about um, uh, gge a little bit uh, they did meet um, already, and one of the encouraging things about the, the, the sort of uh, discussions from the GGE in Geneva is that there seem to be um, um, almost a con you know emerging consensus that the human control is a very important uh, dimension of it, and they, they they all seem to agree that you know humans should maintain control over lethal force. Um, 
I think it will be um, you know the, the the next one next meeting that that is taking place in the last week of August will be a, a critical one because they now have to um, recommend what will be the next step um, and um, you know depending on the outcome um, I think there they might be a risk of some countries starting to say that we should take the discussions out of the CCW context. I don't know um, if, if it's mature like that. I mean, we, we have an a, you know, example of a landmine treaty, the, the cluster munitions. Um, it will, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to, to, to um, prejudge anything because the meeting um, has not um, happened yet. Um, but definitely the member states are already beginning to um, really you know, go down to the critical nature of those discussions. Um, what we, and then they, they will have to be a, a, some sort of a norm. Um, some countries are in, in favor of legal norms being negotiated. Some countries are saying, let's actually start with a political norm, political declaration, politically binding uh, restrictions, stop short of legal. Um, I don't know if, um, if the, I mean, and then you will probably know much better uh, how mature the discussions will be. But certainly I think the process, some, some form of a process will continue. Um, beyond uh, the current uh, um, mandate of the, the GTE. Uh, so it remains to be seen. And what we really need to make sure um, is that um, everyone really has to understand that this, when it comes to those issues, because the, the you know, implications uh, is still largely unpredictable, we don't know exactly what will be the implications. Um, we need to, again, make sure that, um, you know, actors beyond governments uh, will have much more awareness and involvement and participation in some of those uh, um, debates. Um, would some sort of a, um, you know, uh, government sort of official restrictions, whether that is legal or political, would that be sufficient? I personally don't think so. I think they, it would be useful to have some sort of a code of conduct um, on the part of, um, you know, scientists and, and engineers signing up to responsible um, innovation and, and application. I mean, what happened with the Google, uh, Google um, you know, when it comes to AI um, a couple of months ago it was quite encouraging from that point of view. So, I mean, a little bit similar to how the nuclear scientists, um, you know, after the, um, you know, the, the Second World War, uh, there were a large number of scientists who have actually become very, very active in, in nuclear disarmament uh, field. Um, something similar, I think, will be uh, quite important. Um, but um, I agree with you um, that the real danger will be a combination of those new technologies, with especially with uh, weapons of mass destruction. So. Thank you. We'll return to that probably uh, in a moment. So I have uh, I have Jessica, Elaine, Yelena. I have a new hand up, uh, and so why don't we proceed in, in that order? Uh, <coughs> try to discourage two figured interventions at the moment, but we may have to resort to that depending upon the uh, excitement that I see generated by others' comments. So. Uh, Jessica, do you want to? Yes, Jessica Barnum from CNN. And uh, as you know, your organization here has an immense focus on education. And certainly the UN has commented on many occasions about the importance of nonproliferation and disarmament education. And you talked about the role of the younger generation. But what I'm wondering specifically is what you feel the international community, including at the UN, could be doing, should be doing in the future to encourage uh, more widespread education of especially young people in non-proliferation or disarmament because obviously to even get to education here you have to have someone who leads you in that direction and this is one organization and we obviously would love to see education happening 
um, at the high school level, for example, in, in every high school in the country or even the world, but it, it, it doesn't. And so what can we do to facilitate a much more widespread understanding of the issues of concern? We, we didn't plant that question yeah. either. So we, we, we talked a lot about this this yeah. morning, Jessica. I'll, I'll yeah. let uh, the high representative respond as she sees fit. Should I? Well, let's maybe we'll take it. Let's take uh, uh, Elaine. Do, I expect maybe on a different topic, but do you want to uh, ask a question and then we'll. Uh, 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 ask sure, you to I will. I will make a comment and then try to answer and complement um, uh, the representative's um, request for um, further input about about the discussion on lethal autonomous weapons that is taking place in Geneva at this moment. But I would also like to start by 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 also complimenting you. Uh, for the role that you have been playing and the leadership and all the, the new uh, leadership style that you have uh, contributed with uh, in the field of Um uh, We were already between the first and the two sessions of the, nego the second session of the negotiation of the bank treaty when you, uh, when you took over, when you were appointed. And of course, um, in my case, I had this a you know, big question mark about who it was going to be. Um, and um, I have to tell you, you were um, uh, making some comments about the way in which I, I you know, steered the negotiations in a very difficult, in a diff very difficult <coughs> moment. But I also have to say that you, uh, this was also very difficult for you because you, are, you started your, uh, your uh, tenure in a moment of, of uh, great tension of great pressure between uh, different camps and that you were able to um, to bring a, a very uh, serene uh, posture on the side of the secretary and um, trying always to bring to uh, build bridges but also to look at the long term um, I think um, your um, your message and your narrative for the delegation especially for the conference was also a, a, a very important uh, uh, input. Uh, and I still remember this um, statement you um, um, gave us um, that called on the conference to produce a treaty or an instrument that was politically wide, yes. <laughs> techno technically accurate, mm -hmm. and uh, legally sound. Mm -hmm. And that was a that was a, like a very um, I would say a very serene uh, message that was very well taken taken on board. Um, so it was not it was not a surprise for me when I saw the the release of the of the agenda by the Secretary General. I was there in Geneva, and um, from the point of view of let's say a country that has been working in the field of disarmament from the history of the Second Republic of 70 years. And um, being in Geneva, an, an operator in, in a place where we see everything from nuclear disarmament to landmines, this was the first time in which I saw a comprehensive framework that was rational and that helped all of us to understand how each piece of what we work do make a sense and, 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 um, and is interlinked with uh, the overall objective. Um, so I would, I really would like to congratulate you for this work. I do take note of the fact that it is the first time, as you say, that a Secretary General uh, proposes a conceptual framework to, to work. So I think it is, it is going to be a very good um, instrument in order to navigate um, in, in this ecosystem of disarmament and security. Um, uh, which brings me to the issue of participation and um, uh, the discussion of uh, lethal autonomous weapons uh, at this moment. I think the, the one of the experiences of the of the conference in bringing in, in giving a, a more official role to the civil society, what um, was highlighted there was the civil society is no longer what it used to be. Or it's, I mean, the perception is not the same. It's not um, the perception of a bunch of activists, you know, you know just shouting outside with big uh, signs. Um, you have experts, and you have scientists, and you have 
a great wealth of knowledge to contribute to the, to the government. And I think this is something you have uh, very well captured in the design, I mean, in the design agenda. And I think what it is needed now is a discussion for, you know, for the new generation of war because um, we are sitting in a room in Geneva discussing about human control, significant human control, and what the international community does for the new generation because we have not solve the problems of the, of the 20th century in terms of uh, yeah. uh, disarming uh, security. And yet we have to react to this 21st and 22nd uh, generation of threats, um, of challenges. The only, the only way in which we can actually react is by incorporating the people who are working and are generating these new tools and technologies. I don't see any other, any other way. And, um, uh, the state of the discussion at this moment is that um, we have two visions uh, from part of the government. One that um, prefers to go and develop a norm, to go on and develop a norm that prohibits um, the, the development of, and use of technologies that uh, break the cycle of responsibility, um, the human cycle of responsibility and state responsibility. Um, there is another vision that says, you know, whatever comes out is going to be covered by the international humanitarian law. And uh, by the way, there's nothing to worry about because this is purely science fiction. This is not something that is being developed. Um, and there is another, another vision that uh, does acknowledge um, the challenge. But say, well, what we have to do is to have a public declaration um, in terms of a binding public declaration that this, uh, that allows us to, to keep on to keep on um, having a conversation. But there is a, a third, I would say, a third way uh, that a group of countries has been articulating, which is that we do want to have a norm that regulates. That we have to, we would like to have a heavier or stricter regulation of this. Uh, but we understand that you don't get to a, to a legal, uh, legal regulation out of the state in which we are. And we do need a political statement in which um, we, the international community kind of frames the problem and, and um, tries to, to create a rational for future action, but we do think that this does not start with political declaration, that the pre political declaration should contain the elements uh, of, of future regulation, and um, the political declaration does not substitute a legally binding norms. So we'll see how this um, will unfold in, in two weeks' time. Uh, just on this, I mean, you know, it's it's very much like you know AI, uh, machine learning, all these technologies. A little bit like, um, you know, Chris always says it's it's like um, um, uh, internal combustion engine, which was not, you know, created to be weaponized, or I would say also electricity. Um, but because of the invention of those, you know, engines or electricity. The, the way in which we fight wars have really enormously changed. Um, so, I mean, AI is a little bit like that. It's an enabling technology. So, you know, we cannot actually ban the technology itself. There, there will be no way to ban the technology. Um, so I, I think it would be probably a, a, a very much of a combination of variety of measures. When it comes to you know ap applying those technologies for so clearly um, you know uh, weapons uh, which is to cause direct harm, um, I think hopefully there will be some sort of a, a, a norms uh, being developed. Um, but also um, we have a um, already existing instrument called Article Thirty Six of the Geneva the Protocol, um, and and we don't know. You know whether the states, um, states parties to, to the protocol, have been actually using the article or not. This is the weapons review. The, you know the, the signatories 
uh, required to review new weapon systems to make sure that the new weapon system is in, in accordance with the humanitarian principles. So, so there is some sort of an existing instrument. Um, so we need to look at that and then make sure that those things actually, that what we have already, uh, will be you know effectively uh, used. Um, so you know I'm I'm actually quite interested in in, in you know how to. I mean, again, we will start with sharing of information, national experiences. I mean, we know that some countries in Europe have been doing that after the, the review under the Article 36. So, you know, it would be interesting to find out what might be, you know, their experiences in, in, in those new weapons review. Um, and two, you know, call of conduct, uh, voluntary, uh, um, you know, moves by those uh, scientists themselves. Um, so there, there will be a variety of means um, to actually look at, uh, um, you know, when, when it comes to norms and regulations. It's not just one, um, but we have to be, again, very creative and, and, and think about how to, you know, combine some of those uh, very different sets of measures. I, I mean, Maybe briefly, you might want to just, you know, mention in response to Jessica's question, uh, the this new initiative on cultivating youth champions and disarming non-proliferation. We, we, that was a focal point for our discussion, and uh, we can talk at length about that. But for those who weren't present, just a word or two about that initiative, I think might be helpful. Yeah. Um, I am personally really keen on this uh, youth engagement. Um, it's almost, I mean, I, I almost hesitate to call it disarmament education because it's a little bit beyond that in my view. Um, what I think will be quite useful is that young people um, are properly capacitated and, and, and empowered with the right kind of knowledge. Um, and it's not just about disarmament, arms control, sort of instruments and sort of technical part of it, uh, but they really do understand that those um, disarmament-related uh, um, actions are important part of security. Um, so I, I very much like to combine those disarmament education with, uh, in, you know, um, international peace and security um, type of uh, knowledge as well. And again, I, I think I mentioned uh, the evolve. You know, the concept of security has evolved, and, and young people again properly understanding. I mean, environmental security. I mean, you know, all these new concepts related to security really needs to be uh, uh, properly uh, understood. It's it's no longer just territorial defense. It's not enough for security. Um, so you know, so those theoretical or, or, or knowledge part of it. Um, and then targeting really uh, younger people. Um, and this is just out of my own experience. I, I try to receive, I'm Japanese, but I've you know, now lived more than half of my life uh, outside Japan, but I try to receive uh, young people, young Japanese people you, you know, when they come to New York. And, and my impression is that we need to actually start them. Um, you know, when they, <clears throat> When university students come, I mean, their way of thinking is already kind of fixed. So, you know, we have to target younger generations starting um, high school, even, you know, middle school, I think. I don't, I mean, I don't know uh, to what extent we could do, the UN could do. Um, um, we think it would be much more effective to, um, to have partners, um, you know, like you. Um, so we're developing this, uh, um, you know, uh, initiative targeting uh, uh, younger uh, generation that will, you know, make sure that they have some opportunities to get those knowledge part, but also I think the skills, if they really want to, you know, um, be part of this uh, broader sort of if you will, peace movement, social movement, then they need to understand what are the right skills that they need to be an effective advocate um, for uh, peace and security and therefore disarmament. So what are the kinds of networking skills, the advocacy skills? So I, I think um, um, those um, you know, projects, uh, useful initiatives, should have both uh, dimensions. Um, and then the 
Um, another um, thing that I wanted to also bring in here uh, is to make sure that um, um, you know gender perspective. I mean, there will be more women, um, you know, taking those issues uh, very closely um, into them. I mean, they, you know. I think uh, we are taking a, a lot of uh, um, gender initiatives as part of the, the agenda as well, but also that has to start early. Um, I mean, my hope is that there will be more universities that will have courses on those kinds of issues. I mean, I don't know in Japan um, how many universities have these kinds of, you know, issues. I mean, Japan is a, a little bit of a special case, I and mean, there is a, almost a, you know, disarmament actions are very much of an emotional uh, um, work. It's not really linked up with uh, properly with the uh, security studies. Um, that's um, that's a sort of unique history that we have since the World War Two. But um, but they they will therefore um, need to be more education um, um, academic opportunities. I hope um, more universities. I hope will be interested in teaching courses related to these. But um, great. We'll also come to one. <laughs> we'll try to do our our part here. Yelena, I saw you. Yep. Up next. Yeah. Um, Yelena Sokola, uh, CNS. Uh, one of the uh, questions that I have related to the um, use of the uh, existing UN uh, and global disarmament machinery, and uh, how some of the actions and the agenda developed is geared towards to reviving the ones that don't work, specifically the conference on disarmament. Uh, and uh, also, what are, what are the uh, ideas or plans for holding, say, a fourth uh, uh, conference on disarmament? Um, in addition, uh, if I may, kind of the second question is, this is a very ambitious, very needed agenda, but uh, in addition to the UN itself, um, what is uh, required probably a very kind of active uh, set of countries, kind of partners in, in the, uh, we, uh, we talked about the civil society kind of partnership, but I also need to have a group of countries that are really promoting that. And I wanted to hear more about what work was being done, who you're working with. Uh, Great, thank, thank you. you. We'll take another question, and then we'll let the high representative respond. Please, Please try to introduce yourself. Um, my name is Nick Seltzer. Actually, I'm a student here. Um, I haven't been on campus for about eight months, because I actually just came back from an exchange semester at Wasa University. Oh, my Tokyo. school, yes. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Drinking is uh, um, uh, um, a serious habit for one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's academically huge. We're, 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 we're still being <laughs> 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 insert myself in the in the list here but please okay yeah. all right so this machinery um, it is true that we you know we we tried um, I mean we, we are calling on um, members of those existing machineries to step up um, and then making sure that they return to, I mean, when it comes to CD, the Conference on Disarmament. Um, there is a small positive sign in Geneva, um, you know, the, the five sub sub subsidiary, or is it working group, whatever it's called, um, subsidiary, subsidiary um, 
bodies. Um, so they are starting or restarting some substantive discussions and, and I would definitely like to um, uh, push members of a CD to really return to um, you know, what they're supposed to do, which is a negotiation. Um, I mean, I have been spending, uh, I have been to Geneva and I addressed the CD, um, you know, more than in the past uh, high representatives. I think that's something that we, we really need to do. And I'll tell you why, one of the reasons why we continue to do that is precisely because there is probably an opportunity called SSOD4. Um, you know, the special session of the General Assembly is the place where the member states come and think about disarmament machinery. Um, and um, we don't know when that will take place, uh, but there seem to be some appetite to, you know, I mean, there is at least uh, the outcome of the working um, open-ended working group, which, to be honest, came as a, a bit of a surprise. Uh, we were not really expecting a positive outcome from that, but, um, but thanks to member states, um, you know, there seem to be opportunity coming, you know, I don't know exactly when, but a couple of years uh, down the line. So, again, a lot in those multinational processes depends on how successfully you will be able to create a momentum. Mm -hmm. um, now that there is that opening, um, I would like to definitely work with some of the member states and create that momentum, um, and that will be an occasion to, in fact, think about what are the kinds of machineries that we need uh, in the 21st century to you know, discuss and negotiate disarmament issues. Um, so we are in the beginning of that process of thinking through and then creating momentum and then down the line I think there will be hopefully an opportunity to actually uh, discuss. Um, the member states will have an opportunity to, to discuss this. Um, so let's um, you know, and then where you know where we, we we as the secretariat can make a difference, um, we are saying. I mean, I, I want you know we are part of the, the machinery. ODA has to become much more of a sort of strategic coordinator, in addition to just being simply a secretariat uh, to you know to those different bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to definitely make sure that Unidir, um, you know. Um, increases its strategic role in, in research um, and I think they are already um, you know on their way to, 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 um, to accomplish that uh, with a new director um, and uh, also the um, ABDM um, I think um, it would be really good you know the sector general um, this is the uh, advisory board yeah I'm sorry, sorry ABDM is advisory board of secretary general on disarmament and matters yes um, so this, uh, um, you know, the board will start having uh, much more of a sort of serious uh, strategic advice directly to the Secretary General and then SG this time uh, spent some time um, and um, met with her and then had a, a discussion on, on how to, you know, implement this. So, um, so we need to reactivate different parts of the machinery and then we will do what we can do uh, just that. Uh, and then uh, help create momentum uh, for member states to, you know, have the ambition of looking more, you know, strategically the machinery it's the, uh, itself that they have to also engage. So, so that's the the machinery. Can I answer my suggestion yeah. on, on this point because that's one of the few things that I can speak with any, you know, experience yeah. here. Um, I think that what worked particularly well, and it may just have been a confluence of, you know, uh, circumstances, but this is when Gianta uh, Apollo was the Undersecretary General. We had an exceptionally incompetent uh, board. It was somewhat larger uh, than today, but there was a, I think, a sense that there was a potential partnership between those members of the board who were not uh, serving government officials and might have more time perhaps to think, um, just to, to think, but also to think outside the box, and to partner with those 
states who are represented on, uh, represented on the board mm -hmm. to put forward actual initiatives within the UN system and other negotiating fora. And that's really how the, the, uh, the, uh, M the UN Experts Group on Disarmament and Nonproliferation happened because we had Miguel Marin Bosch, a very senior Mexican diplomat who took an idea from the board and then brought it forward on behalf of Mexico. And there were some, several other initiatives uh, that uh, uh, dealing with non-strategic nuclear weapons, which also came out of the board, uh, were of interest to some countries who were part of the New Agenda Coalition, and they made some headway uh, through the process. So I think there's an opportunity on the board uh, to really engage it as a vehicle uh, for, for change. Mm -hmm. And it's, all, it's, and it's really a function of the perceived interest on the part of the Secretary General and the High Representative and the tasking of, of uh, the right people on the board to undertake that kind of initiative. So I think that's a, a mechanism that can be absolutely. used uh, yep. you know, effectively uh, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and, and very small things can make that easier, right? I mean, for example, in the, in the, the just the last meeting of the, um, the board, which took place in June, I, I suggested that perhaps they, you know, they, they change the timing of the second meeting to coincide with, for example, the first meeting. Um, so, you know, so that it would be easier for the board to also, you know, feed into the member states' deliberations at the first committee. I mean, those small mm -hmm. things uh, can actually make it easier for different parts of the machinery to, to function. Um, so, you know, we, we're very much looking at uh, some of those. And then, you know, the current uh, board chair um, is very keen to also work with the chair, this time is Romania, uh, of the first committee to, to help us um, bring this uh, forward um, in, in the first committee. So, so we're definitely looking at uh, some of those. Um, Japan, I mean, the government's position is very well known, uh, and it's a, it's a very sensitive uh, um, issue um, for, the, for the government. Um, you know, our line, um, the sec sec Secretary General and the Secretariat's message on the Prohibition Treaty uh, has been very clear. Um, that is that as the secretariat, of course, we you know we support this. And we now have a um, you know um, I think it's a website guidance on how to go about ratifications, etc. Those informations actually matter, and that's a, a useful you know secretariat role that we can we can do. Um, but if if the if the government, but at the same time, we don't comment on individual governments position and then criticize. I mean, it, it, it's not just about Japan, but if uh, country X uh, chooses not to, uh, um, you know, sign the treaty, um, you know, it's the sovereign decision of our government. So it's, you know, we don't interfere and we don't criticize. Um, and I think that position is well also understood by the Japanese government, and that's the Secretary General, um, you know, that's, that's what the, the message was. But, we also say that if you choose not to be part of a provision treaty, then please we double your efforts. Please make visible, practical um, steps uh, to reach, um, you know, nuclear free world. Um, to the, the nuclear weapon states, uh, we always remind them of the Article Six of the NPT obligations. Um, we also, I mean, I don't know if it's, it has always been like that, but the Secretary General has also started to encourage publicly um, the United States and Russia to, at a minimum, renew the new start beyond 21. It's a bilateral agreement, so I mean, I don't know if, if the UN has ever said it publicly in the past. At a minimum, renew it, and then please also, you know, negotiate further reductions. So we, you know, our message is not just focused on on this, but again, we bring a variety of measures um, which can be taken by different uh, groups of uh, uh, member states, nuclear nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states, you know, countries that are under the nuclear umbrella, and um, and so. Um, 
So I, I, I think the message so far has been very clear. Specifically, on Japan, I'm Japanese, I communicated quite a lot in Japanese with, I mean, this time, um, I met with the uh, political lead party leaders, uh, in addition to government uh, officials. And, um, and what I said to them is to deepen discussions, domestic internal debates. You know, I did not say either way, um, and I always use factual uh, statements. For example, my predecessor, um, a Japanese predecessor, Ambassador Abe, uh, has been publicly repeating in his remarks that perhaps um, one way of, uh, um, you know, in a very subtle way uh, of um, um, message that the Japanese government can, can use is Japan is not able to sign this prohibition treaty now which is a difference between Japan is not signing, right? So there are ways of communicating the same thing, uh, but with some sort of a nuance. Um, so I'm not saying it, I'm just quoting, for example, Ambassador Abe, my predecessor, um, has been suggesting that there are different ways of commenting on, on, on the treaty and the Japanese government's position. Um, yeah, but um, what I... I think Japan and other countries need is for you know parliaments and, 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 and you know experts and, and also general public level uh, there has to be uh, more in-depth debates um, because that's democracy and that's how policies are you know supposed to evolve. Great. So I uh, 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 hope my uh, fire for the moment, and let Masako and Jean perhaps ask questions. We we are uh, kind of reaching uh, uh, the point where we're going to have to wind down shortly. But uh, Masako and Jean, if you'd like to ask questions, and then uh, we'll give the high representative a chance to respond. Yes, thank you so much for your insight. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is uh, going back to education. I work with, I'm promoting the summer education for young generations and then based on my experience and uh, I really feel the importance of the local government. Of course, it's important to work with international uh, civil society and educational institutions. But eventually, those, uh, it's so important to reach out local communities. That's where real you know, it's, uh, promotion is going to happen. So what's your view on now? Uh, 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 working with, or I, I'm sure that the UN is working with the mayor for peace well, to some extent, but uh, do you have any uh, idea or your view on enhancing collaboration with the local government in terms of promoting non proliferation and disarmament education? Just in Japan and we're just. No, oh, of course, overall, yeah, all over the country. I thought all over the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, Thank you. Jean Dupre, I'm an independent consultant that's former CNS and CGBTO. Um, and I'm a representative. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, and uh, um, I, I must say, the, the feedback that I've heard from New York and other places where you've been active, uh, I've you know, witnessed myself. So, uh, very fresh, fresh air blowing through the UN um, <laughs> on the 31st floor of the <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to slightly have a slightly different uh, question. You talked about the implementation part of this uh, agenda being very challenging and, and I, I can foresee that. You also mentioned right at the beginning of your remarks um, the sustainable development goals. So my question and thinking is how, uh, what is the, is there any thinking, and I'm sure there is, on how to synergize the, the disarmament agenda with the agenda for 2030. Um, we all know that obviously sustainable development goals 16 and 17 kind of, that's mm -hmm. uh, peace, justice and strong institutions and, and partnerships. But not only those two, I mean, how, is there any thought being given on how to bring that together? And it struck me, I was at a conference organized by, by your office in uh, Port of Spain, recently at the UN office there. And in a, in a room not much bigger than this, the Sustainable Development Goals were 
post-its on the wall, and for each of them the priorities for CARICOM were highlighted. Mm -hmm. Under 16, the priority for CARICOM is, of course, border controls, yep. uh, you know, drug issues, and so on. Nowhere in those priorities are issues of disarmament. Um, and I think CARICOM for you know, those countries are kind of a, an insight into the smaller countries, which are, as you know, is the majority of the UN. So you know, how, how do you foresee we can synergize that to get more of the normal people involved in the disarmament agenda? They are already very much involved in the sustainable development. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the local government, um, as, as you mentioned, we work with the mayor of Bukis. Um, you know, I, I went and, and uh, spent some time and, and you know, um, discussed what might be our collaborations. I mean, it will be because we are a small entity, we cannot sort of individually uh, uh, engage with many different local governments. It, it's, it's very useful to have a sort of framework and then from that point of view, also the, the mayor for peace has been extremely uh, important. And um, and I think, um, you know, they, for example, also uh, looked at the link between disarmament and other sort of disciplines as well. So they're also a little bit broadening uh, their scope, um, you know, beyond the sort of immediate traditional peace and disarmament type of issues. So so I think it's, um, it's a very um, useful um, very active um, entity, um, and I always enjoy uh, talking to, to them about um, what they could do. I think, again, um, I, I very much agree with you. If we really were to, um, you know, um, reach out to general public, I think it's it, you know we need to go beyond just the central government, um, and, and so um, you know, partnership with local government. In many different, I mean, you know, the um, the Paris Climate uh, Accord. Um, that's a, that's another positive uh, example. Um, uh, many local governments in this country have, um, you know, declared that they will move up with the commitments. So, so they are increasingly becoming a really key actor on global issues, and that's uh, that's quite encouraging. Um, um, the SDGs, you know, I, I tell you, um, as a sort of UN practitioner, one of the, one of the learning um, experience for me, and, and also um, challenge, um, as a person who have moved across different disciplines from humanitarian to peacekeeping to development to now disarmament, government, within internal governments, um, the communities are very uh, divided, and uh, you know they are diplomats who deal with humanitarian, and they don't really speak the language. Terminologies are very different, and they don't speak the language of uh, peacekeeping or development. Um, so you know, every time I moved across the disciplines, I had to you know start building my network um, from scratch with those diplomats who deal with these uh, different disciplines. So I don't know exactly how to. Um, 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 you know, um, address those, uh, tackle those challenges. But SDG, from that point of view, is really useful uh, because it's a, a framing, it's an integrating uh, uh, framework. Um, and um, what I noticed is that even though, um, you know, you mentioned CARICOM, but in many different uh, parts of the world, they don't use the terminology of disarmament. But if you talk to those people, uh, government officials, they actually talk about massive challenges related to, to proliferation of small arms as one of the, the biggest obstacles to SDG implementations. So that's, that's an issue. For us, we call it a, a disarmament. So we need to be, I mean, as a UN, we need to also make sure that those issues um, you know, are understood as a critical issue for sustainable development, uh, and then there we can we can definitely you know play a role, make make contributions. Um, so we need to actually uh, a little bit more you know, and then actually the secretary general himself helps a lot because he doesn't like acronyms, he doesn't like the jargons, 
you know, we are constantly told in the UN um, senior management meetings not to use those uh, um, jargons and you know, speak the normal uh, people's language. So I see that especially conventional weapons, small arms issues are really critical to Agenda 2030 and, and, um, um, and going beyond uh, um, 16. There will be an opportunity next year when we have the, the um, high-level uh, political forum to review the sort of progress in SDGs. Um, it takes place next year, and there are already a couple of countries that have come to me um, after the launch of the, the, the agenda, um, suggesting that perhaps we should also use that opportunity next year um, to make sure that the disarmament dimensions of the SDGs will also be reviewed at that um, um, high-level political forum. And I did actually consult the other half of, I mean, UN is one community, but development issues are under the Deputy Secretary General, and I, I, I did go to her um, and then asked for her advice. Um, very useful advice on in terms of how to you know structure the UN for example the funding streams uh, you know funding streams are also very separate between peace and peace and security related budget lines and development uh, so how to make sure that um, you know these um, interdisciplinary kind of um, you know actions are properly resource um, is very useful to, to, to have her advice as well. I think there's another, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I think I appreciate your question as well, Sean, and it kind of brings me back to our earlier discussion this morning on new tools and technologies and also the emphasis that the SG gives to new tools and technologies in this report, because one of our experiences has been that when we go, for example, uh, every summer to Mexico City and we interact with two dozen uh, countries that are represented in the short course that we conduct with, with Mexico and we try to introduce the topic of new tools and technology and I mean particularly of Melissa's experience a couple of years ago uh, the first kind of response I think is you know this is you know fascinating but it doesn't how does it really relate to what we're doing uh, and yet, when you start talking about the relevance of these new tools and technologies for uh, the environment, for drug trafficking, uh, for humanitarian uh, uh, issues, they see an, an immediate connection. And so I think it's probably important as we kind of promote the potential utilization of these new tools and technologies, not to kind of pigeonhole them exclusively in the disarmament and non-proliferation sphere and because and I, I mean we have to I mean, the center has to be uh, take note of this as well to be cognizant of it because I think you can engage different audiences uh, uh, more effectively if you can demonstrate how what you're showing them is relevant to a broader range of, of issues and I think that probably pertains also to the uh, 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 sustainable development uh, goals. So we, we need to think more creatively uh, about that as well, but it's another way in which you can use uh, a focus on uh, a kind of science and, and technology and its applicability across a, a wider range of, of topics. Um, this has really been fascinating. I'm, I'm sorry that we are running out of time and we also have yet to have lunch, <laughs> so that's another driver here. But I, I would uh, just thank you so much for uh, your, you. your very, very uh, uh, important remarks. And I would ask the audience to join me in expressing our appreciation to the High Representative. <laughs>